Women's Health Protection Act would be great, but it would simply codify Roe. It would do nothing to address the Hyde Amendment. It would to return us to sort of the 1977 when Davis was greatly concerned about the limits of abortion that was not accessible to all. So I know that everyone's talking about the Women's Health Protection Act, but I think that that is kind of a way of evidencing how hard it is for us to think beyond what we've had for so long. Maybe this is very niche because I teach gender studies, but Ms. Magazine in 1972 ran a spread we have had abortions where very famous politicians and actresses and activists signed their name publicly coming out that they have had abortions. Um, and then they sent that petition to Congress before Roe was decided. Ms. Magazine has re-upped that strategy. There is now a petition that anyone who is a woman can go online, sign the petition and say, we do have had abortions. And I know that they're targeting high profile women to sign on um, and they plan to deliver this petition to Congress. I think it's a missed opportunity, I, I suppose is a generous way of putting it that Ms. Magazine has decided that that is something only open to women who have sought abortion care and that they're not making the links between attacks on abortion and attacks on trans rights. Um, so that's one thing. And I also just think that it's another form, more evidence of the ways that we keep kind of recycling tools from the past uh, to try and face down conditions that are very different from uh, the ones in which those strategies were first born out. So that's my, just a couple of ways that I think we kind of stay very connected to Roe. So if I'm going to say that, Sarah, then like, what are the other ways? Um, I think I'm going to talk about a couple of things that I at least try to introduce to my students. Um, and you all can, you know, we can talk about it in the Q&A if they're useful or if they're old news. Um, in terms of legislation, the Ensuring Abortion Coverage and Care Act, the EACH Act, would actually uh, take takes direct aim at the Hyde Amendment in order to make abortion um, available to all, so universally accessible for people who are in Medicaid. Also, it it um, it doesn't allow private insurance to restrict coverage of abortion. I know that people here are familiar with the DC Abortion Fund um, and have been doing fundathon activity for them, which is awesome. Uh, I do really think that the abortion mutual aid infrastructure has been for many decades, like the one thing standing between state neglect and violence and the people who need abortion care. And it's, you know, that's why I think so many people in the wake of the leak have referred to those networks as being on the front lines. Um, in DC, there's also DC Doulas for Choice that works closely with DCAF, as well as the DMV Abortion Support Network that also works closely with DCAF, um, providing transportation and housing and general abortion accompaniment to people who are coming to the DMV for abortion care. Um, so if those, you know, are places where you are thinking like what is happening locally, I encourage you to look there. Um, I also tell my students that we could do a lot more to educate ourselves about medication abortion. The landscape of abortion has changed dramatically since 1972. Um, and now it's quite easy to administer self-managed abortion through misoprostol and mifepristone. Um, it's something you can do in the privacy of your own home. The FDA has not made misoprostol and mifepristone available over the counter, but there is no reason that those drugs should not be available over the counter. Um, and I think that that both kind of like targeting the FDA restrictions and doing the self-education work or community education work to figure out where do you get mifepristone and misoprostol, how do you administer it, um, that that is really like a, a sort of 
mutual aid self-help thing everyone can do in the moment. Um, in terms of thinking about Medicare for all as a pathway to abortion, I think that's another exciting path that I talked to David and Molly about on the phone when we were talking about this event. Um, I also think there's opportunities to target the marginalization of abortion care that currently exists. So abortions are overwhelmingly performed at isolated abortion clinics. Um, uh, medical students rarely get training in abortion, either in med school or during residency. It's something you really have to seek out. And both public, public and private hospitals rarely perform abortion. And all of those institutions that are charged with providing care have kind of been let off the hook by the intense focus on abortion clinics. So that I think is another pressure point. Um, the last thing I wanna mention before I like, hopefully you'll humor me with this activity is um, that social norms can also be a very powerful antidote to punitive laws. I consistently find myself returning to the historian, um, a historian's work who looked at abor when abortion was illegal in the early, you know, up to 1973 in the US. And she talks about how in the 1930s, it was much easier to obtain an abortion than it was in the 1960s because there was a widespread sort of cultural understanding that abortion was necessary, particularly in the face of the Great Depression. And this tempered law enforcement's pursuit of abortion clinics, of abortion providers. Um, and often the only time that physicians would be pursued was if a woman had died while receiving care. Um, and I don't know if that's just like me grasping at straws, or if I, you know, I think that there is something really powerful in how culture and social norms can undermine or mitigate the law. And this might be my personal frustration with lawyers, but in the wake of everything happening with Roe, you can hear everyone talking about what the court is going to do, what each justice's words meant, specifically how we should predict what's going to happen based on that. And I don't want to trivialize the force of the law in our lives because it is a violent force to be sure. Um, but I also think that talking about abortion, talking about the abortion debate, doing abortion storytelling, literally saying the word abortion, which I know is such a low bar, but truly that is the bar at this point, um, can help to undo years and years of stigma and marginalization that I think have brought us to the cultural point that we are at now, which is one where people, the abortion debate is so volatile that I think people are just uninterested in even engaging. If they have experience with abortion or know someone who has, they keep it as a secret. Um, and that's why organizations like Shout Your Abortion or We Testify that have tried to normalize sharing abortion stories and just talking about abortion care more generally as an aspect of healthcare, um, I think are really powerful and are something that, you know, even if you don't want to go out and figure out how to use misoprostol and mifepristone and you don't want to kind of like um, do the mutual aid work, you can in your social circles have conversations about abortion. And um, I think that is a equally important drop in the bucket as we all are kind of putting our pebbles in. Um, so I'm happy to kind of talk more about other, you know, the abortion activist landscape in the Q&A, if that was too overwhelming or people have other questions. But those are sort of some of the main entry points that I see into abortion rights organizing and like how the movement has organized itself up to this point. Um, but I, I assume that at least some of you here are also involved in other movement spaces and organizations that are not directly concerned with abortion rights per se, but maybe have, um, you know, want to be in solidarity or have abortion rights concerns, regardless that that's not the central focus. So one thing I wanted to turn back to all of you, since this is a teaching and since I have talked much too long at this point, is that we can kind of reverse the question and say, how can your movement space or org strengthen 
abortion rights internally. If you're in a union, what can your union do? If you're in an environmental space, what can that space do? Um, if you're working in healthcare, what can your what can that org do to try to normalize and lessen the marginalization that abortion care currently sort of faces? Um, what would that particular campaign or initiative look like? And what, if any, additional information would you need about abortion to like carry that out? Um, so this is the part, this is the prompt part where I'm asking if you could like turn to someone next to you and just briefly like engage me in this thought experiment of if you are in a space even if you're not in a political space, maybe you're just in a social space, um, is there a way that you can kind of bring the abortion fight inward uh, as, um, well, like as another way of thinking about how to respond to this moment? Does that prompt make sense? Yes. Yes? Okay, so let's just do it for like five minutes. Um, and then we can come back and if people want to share, they can, and then we will just like abruptly move into a Q&A if people don't want to share. Uh, again, pretty soon. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> well, I can never know. Yeah, I never know. Hey, hey, yeah, and uh, everyone else on the call can turn off their cameras again. No, no, no. You got, oh, well, I'm, a, I'm a supporter for Trump into prison for the rest of his life, at least. So does I'm anyone want to share it? Uh, you know, any it any not, brilliant insights you reached? Believe yes. it or not, I get so, along uh, well with the Republican government. My union is the Okay. As part of their totally release, they want to be elected. We're going to be filing contract for all the collective bargaining agreements. Put a gun to their head, and ensuring that uh, reproduction. Well, he's got a gun. Well, Trump has a lot of support. Yeah, I know. And a lot of them are a lot better than the Trump. Yeah, and I thought it was Republican. Well, he would never be found guilty of felony murder. I mean, felony being directly responsible. That's why I said it. The thing is, some time will talk about it. But I peacefully suggest if Trump didn't think it's hard to say if anyone near Capitol Hill, the U.S. Capitol Police ought to make a finding trade or pull it out. That's why I've been spending all my time re educating them. Other other ideas? Why are you wearing the mask? You hide your identity? No, it's about COVID. Wear a goddamn mask. It's about the goddamn spreading pandemic, spreading death COVID. Man, that's what it's about. I'm acting the way I'm acting. I'm living to be a seventy-seven year old. I'm not vaccinated. You're a goddamn idiot. I'm the brother. If they scream it, then you guys should be quietly, calmly discussing Trump. When this they... guy's at least realizing we're fucking under attack, and the goddamn evil champ they can suck my dick. Yeah, well, so that's one thing though. that we had kind of when you see the GOP running like, like a goddamn power to are, uh, then we finally like the fuck up. You're probably Republican yourself, man. You're on the internet on the cover company, and you're hiding your goddamn identity. The other day, but you know, especially with like the attacks on gender affirming care in Texas, that like there might be no, we're not. We're not. We'll be here trying to find like, safe spaces to read Please, read it over and over and over and over and over and over and and so get just, your head like, on straight. really live on like this region, but like thinking yeah. through like what supporting people are. Just go there and get yeah. your head on straight. Yeah. Thank and you so, I love your voice. That. I love your passion. We're under attack. And you're helping. Go there and educate yourself. Good judgment day, not me. Anybody else? And obstructionists, MAGA, are all obstructionists. Food. This is MAGA behavior. Oh, this sorry. Is MAGA when, when you get to Q and A, I have a question. Okay, maybe uh, yeah, you should use your question as a segue, unless anyone are. has burning, burning desire to share from yeah. the conversation. I can set up a. Button. I was just gonna echo yeah. David's sentiment. I think around yeah. bargaining yeah. for because that was something that we're stuff. thinking about with our union negotiations and because just like a really it shouldn't fall to private Trump. employers and like the union contracts there but like a good way to like but at least secure you're trying protection. to disarm mm -hmm. america yeah you're trying to disarm yeah. the only remaining americans that's it i'm not surprised guns. that oh, unions right. loom large in the responses of this crowd know, but, but it, i 
I also like feel like I haven't seen Somebody a lot of just gets talk the way. on you know whatever. Just Somebody, if you're not on social media, you, God bless you. But I so, unfortunately sometimes go on and that is absent. I, I'm probably in the wrong. I'm in the wrong corners. But so I appreciate those suggestions. Yeah. Um, if you, uh, all right, you're on. You're starting the Q and A. If you act like a Trump supporter, you walk like a Putin. How? How walk, walk like a do we reframe the language, language from being this, abortion is a women's issue to reproductive justice respect. is needed I by everyone, by especially we'll people assigned the female at birth so and not erased right. non-binary yeah. people and trans men? Yes. Well, I think, um, I mean, I will say, I will sort of like offer something that I feel that I learned. I brought like a um, abortion doula who works in Appalachia to my class this semester to talk about the work that they're doing here. And we had, um, you know, like a very, I think, good and challenging conversation about the issue of language in terms of who needs access to reproductive health care. Um, they put up this slide of different words like pregnant people, fetus, child, like kind of all of these um, uh, words that are under debate currently within different movement spaces and ask my students like what comes to mind when you see these words how should we navigate these different terms and um it opened up like an interesting conversation of how to balance making re like kind of as you say in your question reframing how we understand who needs reproductive health care um and making sure that that reproductive health care remains accessible to a variety of populations. So in this particular example, they were saying when my, the abortion doula network says pregnant people, like some of the people who are coming to us for support, like don't, un, don't even understand what that means. If like a female assigned birth, someone who identifies as a woman comes for, um, comes for support, that that doesn't translate. And so I, so that's like, I don't know how helpful that is. That was like a thought experiment exercise that my students and this abortion doula kind of went through. Um, I did say like, how is your collective navigating this? And they were like, well, it's a work in progress. So I don't think that everyone has the, the answers. Way, so I can leave. But um, I, thank God for um, and judgment not me. I, it's a first I don't know process. how you would feel. It's I'd be curious how you feel about like turning to language that is, abortion right. for um abortions for women trans and non-binary people or um rather than having kind of rooting the framework or the slogan in uh gender identities making it broader to talk about the right to bodily determination or gender autonomy um i think that like why i talked about the um you know, oh, this wasn't here. Sorry, I gave a talk like two days ago and they're melding together, but I don't need to tell you here, to tell anyone here probably that like 2021 was the record for both attacks on abortion and trans rights. Like the record number of, you know, bills introduced and passed. And so to me, that is an opportunity to kind of move reproduct the reproductive rights movement from the framework, as you put it, of women's right to choose or women's reproductive health care to a coalitional effort that centers that understands abortion as a broader set of things required for self-determination and bodily autonomy and separating abortion out from health care which i think is a strategy that has major pro-choice organizations have relied on for many decades doesn't get us closer to that I think moving abortion back into a broad kind of package of healthcare or helps make that link easier in like a tangible way. So we're not talking just broadly about gender uh, self-determination and bodily autonomy, but we're talking about 
it's what are the set of kind of um, right. health it's supports abortion. someone would need to exercise to make that broad kind of abstract lofty goal a reality in their lives based on the different challenges or needs that they have in but you know what so that was kind of rambly, but I think like my main takeaway would be to try to more my concentrate my fellow lunatic. Elizabeth Warren's having a birthday 18 days from now. It was Adam Schiff and Diane Feinstein. I, she had the good sense to get her ass out of alcohol. That's all I have to say. I mean, <laughs> so I think, I mean, that's my, those are some thoughts that I have. I don't know if you have thoughts that you would want to share in return. Just consider the First Amendment issue. Please, it's solved. Personally, for me, the GOP behind Brown, they don't care. This, 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 they don't care about babies. The, the Mississippi first time that leaked opinion is right. Friends, far more than a portion. Yeah. Um, because I think it's a good thing. 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 Um, Griswold v. Connecticut. It is just horrifying. Um, and um, I mean, we, we need to make sure that people know that non binary people and trans men have every much need of reproductive health as women do. Yeah, I agree 100%. I think that your comment about, you know, all of the other decisions that cert stand to sort of be threatened should this go forward that elite the draft made very clear are up for grabs. Um, illustrate the, the weakness of rooting those rights in the right to privacy. Um, because that is, there are lots of problems with the right to privacy. One is that it's a negative right, which means the state doesn't have to do anything to make it accessible to people who, you know, like the Hyde Amendment stands. There was a Supreme Court case to try to un to try to challenge it. Um, the, the Supreme Court said, we don't need to help anybody obtain an abortion. We just don't need, we just can't get in their way. And um, the fact that four women tried to sue on the constitutionality of Hyde was not compelling to the court. So privacy, I think, is a weak vehicle for uh, delivering abortion rights, but also delivering the right to gay marriage, delivering the right to same-sex intimacy, delivering the right to birth control, all of the cases that you have mentioned. Um, and I also think that your uh, what you said in your first part of your question about, you know, making this clear that this is about gender self-determination, this is about sexual and bodily autonomy, um, this is ultimately about sexual and reproductive freedom, um, that that once again illustrates kind of th those broad aims, those broad goals have not truly been met by the vehicle of privacy. And, um, that's why we kind of, it, it was sort of like a compromise. It was like, we will recognize the right to abortion up to this point when the state's rights in potential life activists. Um, you know, we will recognize birth control first being granted to married heterosexual couples. Um, there is kind of a politics of respectability baked into the current uh, framework for guaranteeing these rights, that there have always been radical movements saying is a short term, is sort of like not, um, what's, what's the word I want? It's not thinking about the long game because it's not fully securing those rights with the full force of the intent that you have described of like full sexual and reproductive freedom behind them. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm not, 
I think that it is, I don't know why I'm laughing. I was going to say something like only amusing to me, but like it's, it is, I think there are those people who have had those critiques for a long time who maybe are, while terrified, are not terribly surprised because it, you know, we have reached the limits of the liberal rights framework and um, that is coming to pass now. So that's very dark. I apologize that I don't have a, a lighter response. Um, but I, I hear what you're saying. Yes. I just, I, thank you so much for the great answer. I just wanted to add one more really horrifying thing okay. about 2021. Okay. 2021 was the deadliest year on record since they've been taking down names for trans day of remembrance. I think that your comments and questions like reveal another challenge to issues related to gender, like rights related to gender and sexuality and reproduction which is the difficulty and sort of why I did this prompt of like, how can your organization invite abortion into it rather than you going to the abortion rights movement? Um, those issues like of gender identity, of having children, of creating family outside of like the patriarchal white nuclear norm, it's, it can be very difficult for people to see those as sites of politics. I think people tend to see those as individual private decisions. And so there's an additional challenge, I think, for activists when it comes to these issues of convincing people, no, actually how you want to build your family is like a political contest. It shouldn't be, but it is given the threats that we face and given like the fact that family has like the white middle-class nuclear family has for since the founding of this country been the major site by which traditional gender um gender roles and the racial hierarchy are produced and maintained and so getting people to like think that about the family is a political struggle in and of itself but i think that is a place where having conversations that push people to not see the intimate sphere as kind of like cordoned off, which like, as you point out with 2021, both in terms of legislation and the murder of trans people, like it's increasingly hard to deny that that is in fact true, that the family is a site of political struggle. Um, but there are still plenty of people who need cajoling and I think that that is a really useful place to at least start pushing these conversations. Thank so, you. Thank you. Equality thank you. of human rights is yes. all of our problems. Um, but abortion um, rights um, is about women. Is about women. Um, so 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 we're saying that uh, 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 for women Especially with the internet and social media. 
in our heart. Mm -hmm. So I mean, that could be a possible solution that would go against the grain of what the Supreme Court thought would be taken. So what do you think about that? Yeah. No, I mean, I think that that is definitely going to be an important solution and one that unfortunately is already in play because, for example, you know, DC happens to have two abortion clinics that will perform abortions in the second trimester. Um, surrounding states, uh, North, we have a lot of people who, for example, who come from North Carolina where abortion is not permitted that late in pregnancy. And so we already have DC Abortion Fund, which is a mutual aid fund, giving money to North Carolinians to get to the DMV to have that procedure. So what you describe about California wanting to be a sanctuary state for abortion um, is in some ways already in play, but will become more extreme, you know, and people are going to have to go much farther, as you say, in some cases, maybe all the, you know, the West Coast for sure. Um, and so more and more of abortion funds will go towards that long term, that long travel to like, instead of gas mileage to a plane ticket. Um, so I absolutely think that that is an important solution that, you know, communities can partake in to try to mitigate the decision should it come down the way that it looks like it will. Um, and something that abortion activists have had a lot of practice doing already. Um, but the need is just going to make the need so much greater because the travel will be so much more expensive. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yes. I, got, I guess I got a question that's a quick add on. Some states uh, at a state level are planning on making it illegal to not just get an abortion, but to travel out of the state to get an abortion. What exactly is going to be the street level response to that? Like, what what is the solution there? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to, I honestly, this is like beyond my depth. And it like gets a little bit, like I heard two, um, two legal scholars like fielding that exact question on NPR. And to me, it seems like basically people are just making, um, guesses at this point. I, it's like really hard to know how that will be operationalized. Um, except, and, and so all, so I don't want to like make too specific of like a prediction, except to say something that is probably obvious, which is that, um, you know, like young people traveling, um, undocumented people, people of color, like people, Communities that are already highly surveilled by police, I think, will be most impacted by those laws should they come to pass and then be handed down, you know, given law enforcement giving a mandate to try to um, enforce them. But in terms of like the actual mechanics, I really don't know. And it seems like people are still unclear. People who have much more legal expertise than me have are still unclear about like what that will look like in, in real time. Thing, but not like a, a purely good thing. 
so I guess I, I wonder if the, the the version of normalization that is about like I'm proud of having abortion. Like this is a good thing. This is a like if that leads often to it, and if you focus on the kind of normalization that is about like I have done this, this materially improved my life. I don't know where I would be without abortion. Like is there any kind of loss in focusing on that type of as opposed to the more like pride kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm being told to repeat. So the question, sorry, was, was a long question. No, you're good. <laughs> the question is basically um, if you look at pulling on abortion, there's kind of a solid, stable 20% pro. I, I'm just going to, this is, no, sorry, is it 10? I don't know. There's like, pro-choice people no matter what, pro-life people no matter what, and then there is a large majority in the middle who, depending how they are presented with the question, their support for abortion can shift. So do you, do you support abortion in the first trimester? Yes, I'm, that means I identify more with pro-choice, but then that person could be categorized as pro-life if they're asked a question like, do you support it in the second trimester? And they're like, no, that's too long. Um, or whatever other kind of thought experiment we could do. And so the question is, if we're trying to target that majority middle who seems to not be compelled by the pro-choice, pro-life labels, um, <laughs> does it make more sense strategically to focus on stories about abortion that, that evidence its necessity versus stories about abortion that are sort of full-throated, like this is a right, it was great, unabashed. Um, endorsement of abortion is how I understand the question. So <clears throat> I think that, um, what do I want to say? Like, I think that your example of the polling points out something that is a problem for both movements, which is that they are not drawing more people in um, from that middle. And it is because those people don't feel compelled by kind of the rigid and I would argue oversimplifying positions that have come to be associated with pro-choice or pro-life. Um, and so to me, that's why I think storytelling, like these storytelling projects that have popped up in the last 10 years or so are really important because they, you know, there were many years that the pro-choice movement wouldn't um, like Clinton, safe, legal, and rare. Safe, legal, and rare has been kind of like the mainstream democratic pro-choice position on abortion for many, many years. Um, and um, I think that abortion storytelling has pushed back on that, not to say, not only to say like, well, when you put the word rare in there, it further stigmatizes abortion, but also just to say that like there are as many abortion stories as there are people who have had abortions. And I think that the more that kind, if, if only that could be like a pithy slogan, the more that that could like penetrate the broader um, people, sort of like the broader public's imagination about abortion, the better, because um, I think one of the challenges that the abortion, that abortion as an issue has attached to it is how, how off-putting people find the debate. Like they don't want to hear pro-choice and pro-life um, at odds. They feel like they're, and I think they don't feel that either position really captures what they think. Like I gave a talk and some, and I like um, in the fall and I ended and the bartender was like, well, I'm pro-choice, but I'm also pro-life. That probably doesn't make sense to you, but that's how I feel. And I was like, it makes perfect sense. I'm not going to like push on what that means, but I think that in that particular moment, but um, I think that gets at this middle you're talking about. Um, so I'm not going, you kind of presented it as an either or. Do we do like full-throated or do we do complicated? And I think it's more important to have the multiplicity because the complicated can um, lead into my fears that that can like kind of toe the line of like safe, legal, and rare, which is not a place that I want to advocate going back to. Um, but it is true that like full-throated does also doesn't capture the complexity of how people feel about abortion. And 
the pro-choice movement hasn't had like a very good, I think it hasn't done a good job of holding two truths simultaneously that I think a lot of people feel about abortion, which is that abortion needs to be accessible to people who need it and abortion will stop the development of what would be a born a human. Like those two things are true and it's really hard for people to hold them simultaneously and we don't have good political frameworks to cap, to like propagate that, that kind of like uh, duplicity or simultaneous, simultaneous. So I hope that. Thank you. Yeah, um, so this is from an abortion fund in Reno um, that my, my friend's student started and then she brought it to me and it was very exciting. Um, but I think that there's like, I think that the, the reproductive justice movement, in my opinion, has done the most to help um, strengthen that, that connection. So if we're thinking about, you know, mass incarceration or just over criminalization in general, that that fuels mass incarceration, that is like a direct attack on the right to have to, to raise children in a safe and healthy community. Um, and the fact of incarceration of depriving someone of if you have is also MAGA wearing bullies, on, you know, trying to uh, rule over your school, coordinated resistance against them, telling them the truth and coordinated actual resistance. Don't family. put up with their um, goddamn bullying crap. And so people, I think there has been more in recent years of like police brutality is a reproductive justice issue because I cannot trust that I live in a community where cops are going to murder my kid or break into my house um, uh, without cause and violence against me or my family. And so um, thinking, like I think that is a different framework for making those connections. Um, I think the family pack is more of the even, you know, RJ has been saying that for years, but more recently kind of like to divest, invest or defund um, framework. I think that's what the family pack is getting at is why are we investing in violent systems rather than supporting um, infrastructures of care and support that would allow people to like make the decisions they need at any given time in the course of their lives to build the type of family or not that they want with, you know, without fear of um, violence or early death that comes at the hands of, you know, over, over like police officers that have been anointed to act with impunity. Um, so that's, that's what a couple things I would say. It's important enough issue. Motherhood is a significant issue. I think that I don't see any more hands, which is great. Oh, no, so sorry. I have like, I don't know if I have a well baked question. Okay, I'm sure it's well baked. Yeah, even if not, you're standing on like the word perspective. And like some of the signs that you saw at the rally more recently in the past month were about like further that measures like you were talking about in the way this like excerpt about like abortion plus sterilization. Yeah. And I guess like that's the bottom line. What's your criminal take on that kind of similarly punitive um, like that people are trying to make and like how do we dissuade people from like Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so time's right. ticking down. 
So I assume, so just so I understand before I repeat the question, it's like the signs that were like the justices should right is it all, like, they should all get vasectomies or be yeah okay yeah yeah so um the question is what do i think about like the response so like responding to the misogyny that of course is driving the restrictions on abortions um responding to that with like well actually how would you like all men should be sterilized or all or you should the supreme court justices should be uh, forced to undergo vasectomy so that they can like feel you know like a tit for tat i guess like for their like on the point of neutral versus good messaging like what do you think about negative yeah messaging? yeah and and the point that this is negative messaging that might not actually draw people into the movement but would further turn them off and, and to that yeah correct um, yeah, so I'm glad you asked that because I do remember seeing those signs at the Supreme Court. Um, and um, I mean, I think that actually gets back to um, this person's question or our conversation that isn't here anymore of like when abortion is, like, I think that response is only possible when someone is thinking about abortion purely in gendered terms of like, this is a woman's health, this is a woman's issue, that or that abortion restrictions are solely driven by misogyny and so a very like single um a singular kind of feminism is the response when that is your analysis like the vasectomy is your response in my opinion um because you're only thinking about it from the framework of like this is an attack by men on the like men trying to control women's bodies so now i'm going to turn around and say well you should have your body controlled as a response and obviously that is a huge part of it um but i think when you can kind of broaden the framework to say like to your point of how do you draw people into the movement well this this is potentially like this is kind of like setting the terms of what is acceptable to do to a certain population and that like has ripple effects because it's sort of like okay you're the testing ground but that doesn't mean that it like can't be it can't then happen to other groups um i mean it's sort of like well i won't i won't put um so anyway i think that my I'm sorry, I'm rambling. The answer that I want to give is what this person was saying, which is like, how do we move this from women's rights to a broader understanding of bodily autonomy and self-determination? Because what, and maybe restorative justice would be helpful here, because as you said, it's like punish, meeting punishment with punishment. And I think that it's not, um, like building a movement based on punishment and like rounding up all people who can like, I don't, who can ejaculate and saying that the answer to this is to make them undergo vasectomies. Like that's not a very, that is not a movement dedicated to bodily autonomy. So maybe reminding people that what under, what once you know, the women, the women's rights framework was at base about bodily autonomy. And I think that that can be rec that can be sort of like reclaimed and made more prominent in a broader way that makes connections between the misogyny that is definitely driving the attacks and the transphobia that is driving related attacks. And that all of it is meant to confine people to very rigid gender understandings of gender and kind of like keep them in their place. Um, that's what I would say. It's just a quick solution. I'd really like to get out yes. of it. Do you think that there's something to be said for like not all of those messages or like force men to get vasectomies or supreme justices to get vasectomies, but talking about like forms of male birth control or other forms of birth control for people who are saying like we just don't have sex, the people who are limiting the imagination around where one on unwanted pregnancies come from. But we should have options in terms of male birth control beyond just the condom itself because they, it's not tested, it hasn't been expanded. You know, we put ourselves through a lot, <laughs> or, or people with uteruses mm -hmm. with hormonal birth control and all these different types of things that have only been designed for us and are not safe or not tested. So some of these signs are like 
I'm, I got a vasectomy or I choose to limit my contribution to unwanted pregnancies because I don't want to put someone through an unwanted abortion. So I think there's space to be advocating for that kind of policy change as well. And that's like within the medical. I make my own. Yeah, a big mess. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. And I, I totally agree. And to your point, like, you know, when I was talking about the FDA, like, they restrict the abortion, abortion medication far more than Viagra, for example. So like, I, I appreciate that addition to kind of like what this is supposed to right. signal. It's not just about like, well, limit your, your on my bodily autonomy, I'll limit yours, but it's also about like, what are ways to make the situation better for all of us? Yeah. An educator marveled the facts and turned back every protest that comes up against me. It's probably been long enough. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. So I want to remind everyone again, um, what I said at the here. beginning, a Supreme Court decision could not come down as early as Monday. So if you haven't already, we ask you to sign up on our sign-up sheet. So we're going to be strategizing about what to do next. Also, if you haven't got one of these cards, um, you should check them out. The QR code on the back has a bunch of links, including how to get involved in CSA, including some political education links related to abortion, related to reproduction, reproductive justice more broadly. There's some links to places you can donate, including the DC Abortion Fund, including uh, Partners in Healthcare, which is one of these places that's going to be uh, supporting people coming in from places where it's not stay available anymore. Um, so all those are worth it. I just want to say thank you to everyone who helped make this possible. Um, you know, David, Molly really took point on this, uh, and then thank you so much to amazing speaker Sarah, who uh, you know I've learned more uh, in the back in the past couple of hours than I think I have uh, for the first 27 years of my life. So thank you very much uh, about that. Um, but most of all, thank you, everyone here in the city and who's been listening. You're the people who made this possible. Um, and you are the people who are going to be carrying uh, this uh, energy uh, moving forward. Uh, we really uh, would appreciate uh, for people to, who want to help us fight on this issue uh, uh, to sign up, join our call, because really our intention is to, you know, rallies are good, teachings are good, but we want to see what else, what more we can do. We want to hear from the folks who have that strategic mindset. We know about uh, uh, you have those ideas. So if you have any of that and you'd like to join us, please sign up. Um, and thank you very much so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Like these kind of folks that have things to tell people about. Uh, number one, you want to talk about the search and stuff? Okay, I'll let you go next. Um, for political education, if you're interested in future events, Email us at politicaleducation at ncpsa.org to get connected for future social night school events, one of which is going to be, which I will mention, the, we're going to do a reading group for with, without apology. Um, so I might have more to say about that, but that's going to be on June 23rd. I highly recommend that if you want to keep learning on this issue. Um, Um, so, um, I, I, uh, reading from my, my notes, I went, didn't know that I'd be here, so I didn't get anything done, so please forgive me if I slip up and forget. But this, this coming Friday, um, is a DC Dyke March, um, unpermitted, totally anti-capitalist, um, and, and, um, it's, um, at least I will be there. Um, well, should, hopefully we'll have a few other search firms, people there. Um, if it's something that you're interested in, um, I think it starts in McPherson Square, but I'm not totally positive. Let's, yes, it does. Let's look it up online. Thank you. <laughs> um, and then um, at the end of this month, um, there's the um, a reading group is having a special session on um, without apology. 
And on um, July 11th, we're having a fun event where we're going to have a happy hour beforehand. And then whoever wants to go, we're going to see Bikini Kill, Woo! like the original Riot Girl band. Um, I, I love Kathleen and Hannah. <laughs> they were so amazing in 2019 when I saw them. Um, and if you want to get involved with the Socialist Feminist section, just email socialfem at mdcdsa.org. Uh, or if you join, I mean, it's definitely a Socialist Feminist channel in this class. Um, One. We've been sitting here all day, but if you'd like to get uh, active, um, tomorrow, Medicare for All group has organized a fun run for um, supporting our campaign to end this blockade on medical trade with Cuba. So it's a 5K fun run or walk around the uh, Anacostia River, and you can register at bit.ly slash fun run. And I think that's it. One more. Okay. I'll just talk about it.